distinguished chairman, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, an inspiration for everyone in India, uh, president of the IIMB Council, Saif Qureshi, Sushil Bachani director, Harish Mittal, whose organizational skills and charms have got me here, his team of organizers, faculty, alumni, and students of IIM Bangalore. Thank you for organizing IMBU, the world conclave of IIMB alumni. The theme is leadership and creativity. My co-panelist will speak first, and she is one of India's most illustrious actresses, winner of five Filmfare Awards, five Screen Awards, a national award, and was honored with the Padma Shri in 2014. Her films are the envy of every actress. She blew us all away with Parinita, then with the highly successful 2006 comedy, Lage Raho Munna Bhai, and then in 2009, we saw her in Pa. 2010, a dark comedy called Ishkia. And 2011, a film that created a furore against injustice in real life, which is called No One Killed Jessica. And the same year, she gave us that unforgettable performance as Silk Smitha in The Dirty Picture. <laughs> then again, we saw her in Kahani a thrilling story of a pregnant woman searching for her husband. You know, unfortunately, time is limited. I can't go through all the films she's done because we wouldn't have time to talk about anything else. So I'm going to cut to the chase here and say that she's got films coming out all the time and wonderful films, and she's a terrific actress. So without further ado, please welcome my co-panelist. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw and uh, all you very special people here. A very, very good afternoon. Um, should I say I'm a bit nervous because I'm amongst <laughs> some of the brightest and most fertile minds in the country. And uh, I hope I make sense more than anything else. If nothing else, just consider I'm an actor. Clap, smile, laugh. And I'll just feel better and go back home. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. When I was asked to talk about the interplay between um, leadership and creativity, I was a bit uh, stumped, really, because you know it, it's a topic that's discussed often enough. And it's, it's a very vast and complicated relationship. Um, but to me personally, I think what really tie together leadership and creativity are three characteristics. Instinct, vulnerability, and courage. Um, and, and when I'm talking about these characteristics, I don't mean that one individual needs to possess, possess or show these qualities all the while. Uh, but more importantly, I have figured over time that, you know, uh, it's extremely fulfilling one, when one strives to um, constantly be brave, to really um, make choices that are not easy to make, to put yourself out there unapologetically to know that you may not have all the answers. What the hell? It's OK. Uh, it's OK if you falter. It's OK if you make mistakes. But you know, for me, most importantly, I think I want to be leading my own life. And um, that's where I think the marriage between leadership and creativity shows up. Um, there, there's a TED speaker and author, Brené Brown, um, some of whose speeches I've heard. And she's written a book called Daring Greatly, where she talks about how uh, the secret killer of innovation is shame. Because that's what really prevents us from applying ourselves. You know, every time you think that, oh, maybe I should hold back and not give genuine feedback to a manager, 
or propose a new idea or something like that. What is it that really holds us back? It's the fact that, you know, we may be wrong, um, we may be laughed upon, um, and that's, that's a very uncomfortable space for us to be in. I, for one, have experienced it way too many times. Uh, I think one before every film, but also um, I remember clearly I was going to Cannes. I was on the jury um, of the Cannes Film Festival amongst luminaries like Ang Lee and uh, Spielberg. And uh, my sister, who's really been my hero all my life, she looked at me and she said, why are you looking so worried? You're going to Cannes, you're gonna have a great time. Why are you looking nervous? I said, you know, um, I, I don't know enough about film to be judging films. What if I don't say the right things? And Spielberg, my God, and Ang Lee, and Nicole Kidman, and um, she said something to me that I'm gonna share with you. She said, every time you look at someone who intimidates you, just remember they, they sit on the pot too every morning. <laughs> And that, I think, was such a great leveler, not just because I'm, <laughs> you know, um, the ambassador for sanitation and have been saying, jaha shorch, waha shorch, <laughs> 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 um, But really, I think that was a very, very leveling thought. Um, but going back, when I think of instances, for example, I've, all my career, uh, in the initial years of my career, I was doing films that I thought I should be doing because this is what the Hindi film heroine does. Uh, so there were some gems like Hey Baby and Kismat Connection <laughs> that I ended up doing. They weren't bad films at all. They were actually good films. Um, but I can be uh, self-critical and say that I was atrocious in them. And I, I, I watched those films and I said, you know, uh, there's something wrong. I'm just, it doesn't feel like I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm actually sleepwalking through these films. And I think uh, at around that time that that actor in me must have put out this desire into the universe to do films that really challenge me, uh, that call out to the actor in me, and that's when I got offered Pa in Ishkia. And they were tough choices to make, because in Pa I needed to play mother to a 67-year-old Amitabh Bachchan, um, at less than half his age. And I kept thinking, you know, what if I become the next Nirupa Roy? <laughs> and it's not, it's not a bad thing at all for her, but you know, I was just, um, I wanted to be doing other things too. So, um, I think at that time, I decided that I'm gonna take a punt. What's the worst? I'll do it, and it'll be the end of my career. But then will it really be the end of my career? How bad can it get? You know, I'm an actor, I'll do whatever bit roles I get if that's what it comes to. But this was not a chance I was willing to let go of. So I grabbed the opportunity, and I got offered one after the other very challenging films and I, I really enjoyed each of those experiences. And uh, I was defying norms in those films is what I got told later, I wasn't even aware of it. I was just following my instinct. I was listening to the inner voice. I was listening to my gut. For me, the gut is also the, sorry, <laughs> I get excited sometimes, for me. <laughs> The gut is also the guy up there. So I think it's, um, it really paid off. It paid off and when a punt pays off, it gives you the confidence to take the next one. But over time I've realized that not every risk pays off. And that is also absolutely fine. I'm beginning to enjoy um, the fact that as an actor, there are so many possibilities in front of me, there are so many opportunities that I can make the most of. And, um, you know, they may or may not pay off, but as long as I feel that it's not a decision that I took because I was expected to, I have no one else to blame. And then you're just kinder to yourself. You want to be kind to yourself. So, 
so for me, it's again coming back to um, leadership and creativity. It's for me when you decide to be true to yourself, to pay heed to your instinct, to lead your life the way you want to, creativity uh, emerges, blossoms, and it helps you come into your own even more. Um, I, I've observed this in a lot of people who I've admired, uh, not just people from films, but from people from across the board. There are two very uh, powerful, strong women sitting right here in front of us, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, of course, and Vinita Bali, both of whom who've, uh, you know, defied a lot of norms, done things the way they wanted to, and look at where they are today. Um, I think it's, they keep saying, um, you know, you lead by example. When you lead by example, you inspire. I think, and I, I, just as I was entering, I said, okay, is imbue really meant to be the imbue that is in the dictionary with an extra I before it? And they said, yeah, when someone suggested the name, we didn't even know the meaning. Uh, but it means inspire. I said, uh, okay, so imbue, inspire is really, I'm only really uh, hoping to inspire myself time and again. And I only manage to do that when I'm true to myself. And then you end up inspiring other people. It is a domino effect. So I think I've, um, I'm still... Um, y'all can, y'all can laugh if y'all want. It's been a while since y'all laughed. <laughs> Sorry. No, but, uh, I think this, this really is a process of self-discovery and which is why I'm, um, you know, which is why I delve into a lot of my own personal experiences because I, I can only talk about that. But I think it's extremely empowering, it's extremely fulfilling, it's extremely enjoyable when you lead um, your own life. And what really is creativity also, you know? I keep asking myself, we, we tend to think that someone who can dance or sing or write or, um, you know, perform is a creative person, but I think each of us, the, the um, dictionary definition of creative is really the use of imagination to create something. So it can be anything from creating a very yummy breakfast to creating a module that works fabulously for an entire system at work or to change the country or in a performance. It could work across the board. So I really think that uh, I have begun to look at creativity in a more expansive way. And uh, when I do, I realize that each of us has the potential to create for ourselves and lead our lives. I, can, I can't say this enough number of times, exactly the way you want to. Before I finish, um, you know, because we are going to engage in conversation and with all of you. So um, I was reading about this uh, study that had been conducted uh, amongst children, children who are in class three, when they're asked, how creative are you? Uh, are you creative? 95% of them said yes. By the time they reach class five, when asked, are you creative? the number had dropped to 50% students thinking they're creative. And by the time they got out of school, just 5% thought of themselves as creative. So what does it really tell us? I think the definition of being creative or of creativity needs to really be expanded to encompass so much more, to encompass a new way of looking at things, just an out of box, out of the box way of looking at the same situation, unafraid to take risks, unafraid of what will emerge at the end of it. Uh, I can go on and on, <laughs> but I think um, I'll let Mr. Bedi carry on and then we shall banter a little more. Thank you.
Leadership and creativity, it's, it's really an interesting thought, an interesting concept, an interesting interaction. Because, you know, what is creativity? I mean, even as Vidya pointed out, imbue is creativity. You take the name I-I-M-B and add a few letters and you create a creative third. Um, it's, you think of, say, the ad of the Marlboro Man. And you say, okay, now if you had to give this a, a title, uh, what would you give it if you had to add some body copy to it? Creativity is seen often as the coming together of things previously unassociated to create a creative third. And so you want to give the feeling of ruggedness, manliness, pleasure, etc. And if you say it took a sentence like the rough kiss of Marlboro, you get a juxtaposition of rough and kiss to create a third concept. Um, it, it works in humor too, very often. I mean, who teaches a volcano how to erupt? Who teaches a river how to flood? Who teaches a hurricane how to wreak havoc? Who teaches a man how to find a wife? Who teaches a wife, a woman, how to find a husband? Natural disasters just happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it's linking the concept of natural disasters to something not previously associated, and therefore you get humor out of it. So, creativity is that, that, that creative, putting together of unusual things to create something new, something altogether different. You know, I, I didn't have the online pleasure of being a student at IM Bangalore, but I, I came from St. Stephen's which I regard as a very distinguished institution by itself, uh, as did my friend Shashi Tharoor. Um, and you know, we who were in the arts fancied ourselves as the creative types. And the other chaps were the science types, you know? <laughs> so we had this kind of sense of moral superiority that we are the creative types, they are the science types, even though we knew they'd probably get better jobs than us. But, um, this bias sort of continued when I came to Bombay, the city called Bombay then, and I joined advertising. I worked for Lintas and later for Ogilvy. For five years, I was their film chief. I made lots of commercials. And, I, and we were the creative guys. And we had to deal with the account executives. who had to deal with other people. Uh, in the uh, ranks of the management of the clients. And especially when I was at uh, Lintas, this problem at times became very acute because there were 10 people to say no and only one person on top to say yes. So a lot of good campaigns got shot down along the way. And as a form of protest, the um, creative team of Lintas in New York made a little film. And it showed this very famous ad of a uh, called the Man in the Hathaway ad, uh, the Hathaway shirt. Now, Hathaway shirts are a very famous brand of shirts. It was a black background with a man in a white shirt, beautifully buttoned, tie, standing with an eye patch, and it said, the Man in the Hathaway shirt. That ad sold millions of shirts. Now, they applied this to what would happen in the creative process of going up the ladder in the creative field, in the corporate field. First clients say, yes, it's very nice, very good, wonderful, absolutely terrific. Because you know, men buy shirts to impress women, and women buy shirts for men. So we should include women in this ad. Uh, your woman's in the picture somewhere. So after a lot of argument, a woman is put in the picture looking over his shoulder. Then next meeting, this, you know, we are not a one shirt company. We have a large variety. So Let's just put a panel on either side showing how many types of shirts we have. Um, so that went on. Then various corrections, and eventually came to, let's remove this eye patch. You know, it is a disability. It signals a disability. And so you had a man standing there with a woman looking over his shoulder with panels of shirts. And this, this man in the Hathaway shirt doesn't say anything either. You know, I think you better change that too. You look better in a Hathaway shirt. So that is, 
So in the end, they put the two ads together and said that all these people that made objections were making very responsible decisions. They would think of variety, they would think of sex appeal, they would think of including things. But in being responsible, they were taking the biggest risk of all, which is not standing out, not being creative, not being different. And that was a great lesson to me. That was a great lesson to the agency. And we made fun of it, and systems were changed within the agency, so there was greater flow through from the creative team, the corporate team, so that good ideas weren't weeded out along the way. Now, in the course of working for both Lintas and um, Ogilvy, I realized that this differentiation I had in my mind of creative types and corporate types really wasn't sound. I said, firstly, I am in Lintas, which is corporate. Um, I'm part of the corporation. Um, the, 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 the differentiation that I'm making is false, because everyone at every level is being creative in their own way. In fact, I realized that creativity is the heart of all business. Lee Iacocca said, in business, if you don't innovate, you get run over. Innovate means what? Innovate means creativity. Innovate means reaching out to new and fresh ideas. All technology is the realization of ideas. All new products and services are the manifestation of creative ideas. Similarly, <clears throat> all films are based on creative ideas because if they weren't, the bankers would have taken over the film industry. If it was just about money, the money guys would have taken over. Fact is, creativity is needed by the, creative, by, by the corporate world in films, as is, as are corporate people needed by the creative people in film. So, in business, creativity is needed, but it's a, it's a necessary virtue, but it's a dangerous virtue. As Machiavelli said, there's nothing more dangerous to begin or uncertain of its success than the introduction of a new order of things. And that's where leadership comes in. Leadership comes in through a visionary who is a doer, a man who can think beyond the horizon, think creatively of what lies in the future, and then gets it done. He's the guy that faces the danger, takes the risk and the blame, bears the brunt of the storm, and sees it through. Because turning ideas into projects needs leadership. And there's no substitute for that kind of leadership. A film producer may not know every job under him. There's many jobs he doesn't know. But through his leadership, he brings together a product in the end that is harmonious and whole and hopefully satisfying and successful. So ideas need teams to implement them if they are to become reality. And the coming of the corporates into the film industry has certainly made that a far bigger reality here than it was before. Earlier, there were a lot of mom and pop operations, small family firms that ran the business where people may be competent or not, would rise and fall upon the skills of their children. Today, with the coming of corporates, things have become more systematized. Creativity is needed, but the continuity and the kind of organization that corporates are able to bring to film production has been a huge asset for the industry. And we thank the corporates for their leadership in this industry that we call Bollywood, and I presume the rest of India too. So there's no contradiction in my mind between creativity and corporations. In fact, creativity and leadership are at the heart of all successful enterprises. I would say, not just leaders, corporates, ideas, every one of you, whatever you do, whether you're bankers, whether you're insurance people, whether you're teachers, engineers, whatever, all of you are creative people. Each of you 
has your creative aspect, whether you express it through music or love of films or books or painting or even putting beautiful objects inside your house, that is your creative self that's being expressed. And you know, my father was a great healer and philosopher. And one of his fundamental beliefs was that disease comes from the suppression of creativity. And it's very important, no matter what you're doing, to express your creativity both at work and at home and when in put in positions of leadership to use that creativity for the greater glory of yourself, your society, and your company. Thank you so much. Okay, I think we have time for a brief chat before we um, open the floor to uh, uh, questions from the audience. Um, you know, you strike me as a person that is truly straddling the worlds of creativity and leadership in the corporate world. Because you're married to a man who is the head of UTV and Disney in India. You are an illustrious, highly creative actress. So how does that relationship work? I know he loses every argument, that's another story. Pardon me? I know he loses, he loses every argument, but that's another story. <laughs> but that's uh, her, her ki um, I think, um, you know, as far as work is concerned, I think he has a more holistic approach to uh, films that since we're talking about uh, corporates within cinema, since he works, you know, he's heading a studio that produces films and of course television content and all that. So um, I think I tend to look at it from what we call just the creative side. I tend to address everything like an actor. I've got a more, um, it could be called a myopic view, but I think also a more focused view right. on um, script, um, performances, or the various things that go into making a film, whereas he has, for him, it's more about people. For him, it's more about handling people and channelizing their energies to get the best out of them. Right. So um, we have differences of, of opinion um, on how to be dealing with people because I'm far more impatient than he is. But uh, besides that, I think that really is the one difference in the way we look at our, we approach our work. Um, but we refrain from talking about cinema as much as we can at home. So there's no heavy duty arguments depending on... Um, no, like you said, even if they are, I win them, so... <laughs> <laughs> He's a silent spectator. <laughs> right. You know, um, I was once witness to a, a real corporate creative clash. Uh, I did a film in Hollywood many years ago called The Beast. It's actually called The Beast of War but it was a film set in Afghanistan uh, with a group of Mujahideen after this Russian tank, this was in the 80s. And um, it was based on a very wonderful play by William Master Simone. And um, there was um, uh, a director attached to the project um, who was very bright and young and he was given um, the right to make this film provided he made it relatively cheaply, about six million dollars at that time. And um, the head of the studio was a new person. He was called David Putnam. He had been brought in from England because Sony Pictures, so Columbia Pictures wanted a change of guard, they wanted new type of films, etc. And of course, the entire power system of Hollywood and producers that had sweetheart relationships with Columbia Pictures opposed this man and were determined to ruin him. So when this film went to production, we were shooting in Israel, in that time, the head of the studio was removed. David Putnam was removed. He went back to um, doing things in England and doing things more in charitable causes. He's the guy that made Chariots of Fire. He's the guy that made all kinds of wonderful films for Goldcrest at that time. But um, this director came to a point where he had officially only one day shooting left and about three days work because there was a big battle scene. The studio told him, because despite David Putnam, 
today is your last day. Whether you finish the film or not, we pull the plug. Because they were just concerned about their budget. And to this, um, to his absolute brilliance, he found a wonderfully creative solution. He didn't shoot anything for half the day. He rehearsed it perfectly. And in the second half of the day, the entire battle was shot almost in real time with multiple cameras moving through the, uh, through the, through the scenes of war. And he created a, an epic and memorable scene and finished on time. So that was a battle that the creative team won despite being under enormous pressure. Um, it's shocking to say, I'm not remembering the name of the director. He's the guy that directed Waterworld. He's the guy that directed Robin Hood. He's the guy that directed um, a number of famous films. But this illustrates the kind of, uh, no, not Kevin Costner, not Kevin Costner. Um, with apologies to him, hopefully it'll come back to me before the end of the discussion. But this is the kind of conflict often that happens. Um, but at the end of the day, both the corporate world and creatives have to work together. And I think that's what the true leadership of the corporate world would like to see, as would the true leaders in the creative community. Yeah, I, I think uh, the great merit in what he did was, you know, um, not say, okay, I, I can't do this and I can't. He actually looked for a solution. I think that really is, uh, that's, that's what is path breaking. Um, yes. In, in my limited experience, um, I think we were, I just come off the dirty picture and um, suddenly I was doing this film where Kahani, where I was pregnant and everyone kept saying, but you know, who wants to watch a film about a pregnant woman? Are you pregnant for a bit or are you pregnant throughout the film? Um, because it's really not interesting. So, and um, so within, in our closed door meetings, we kept thinking of various ways to promote the film. And finally I said, you know what, I'm gonna go out with that pregnant stomach and have fun during the promotion. So everyone, <laughs> right. everyone said, what? No, no way. That, that's gonna put people off all the more. And I said, no, I think it can be great. We'll do one event. If it doesn't work, I rest my case. So um, there's car station in Mumbai where I actually landed up with that pregnant, uh, fake pregnant stomach. And um, I have to, there are cameras, so I have to just <laughs> emphasize these things. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, I landed up there and suddenly, I, I was telling people my husband is missing. I was giving them these posters, putting posters up saying if you, you know, if you see him, uh, please let me know. This is my address. And it was, I was just having fun. I was behaving like I was really the character walking the streets. And it gave us so much traction instantly that, you know, um, the team said, the marketing team said, okay, this is what you're going to do through the film, uh, through the promotions. And then wherever I went, whatever I did, I went even on serious um, news channel interviews, I sat there with that fake belly and just, <laughs> you know, had a whole lot of fun. And it worked brilliantly because a film that really stood no chance by the end of it had done 60 crores. So I think it just sometimes, it's about, um, you know, we couldn't have changed the content of the film or put across something in the promotions that wasn't true of the film. So we had to work within what we had. Right, right. Just like your director, I think um, we did that and it was great fun. What I suggest, <clears throat> since we both um, uh, spoken for long and we've only got about 10 minutes left for questions, I think we can open the uh, floor to questions. Ma'am? Um, I think oh, they'll second. have I to, think, I think there's a hashtag that Vasanti is, uh, got some system going where there's a, everything's being done by hashtags and tweets and messages. Yeah, the, it's all thanks to IIM. They have uh, put technology where it matters. And I think uh, all these aggregated questions are now coming at you. <laughs> Both of you. So, first question to you, Kabir, and it uh, uh, 
Uh, the person wants to know what will it take for an Indian movie to win an Oscar? A great film. <laughs> as simple as that. Having, having said that, let me just say I, I'm a voting member of the Oscars um, Academy, and I know that the um, as in, as in every judging contest, whether it's a beauty contest or the Oscars, the prejudices and, and biases of the judges do count. And if you allow for the fact that probably 60% of the Academy membership is over 60, uh, probably 60% or 70% is white uh, and American, uh, the, the kind of films that would appeal to them also would matter. It's not some kind of dispassionate jury from outer space that's sitting there judging the Oscars. Their own feelings do come in the matter. Of the Oscars given to the best foreign films, more than 70% have gone to uh, European films. So there's a natural um, relationship there where they can identify more with Europe rather than Asia or Africa uh, or South America. Um, for as far as the foreign films go. So those are factors you have to consider. But at the end of the day, we must enter something that is truly a great film. They love films that have great human stories. Um, they love films that challenge adversity. They love films that have deep human themes, um, wars or, you know, concentration camps uh, or uh, the suffering of um, people in Sarajevo. Or these are the kinds of things that affect them. Or you get into the Italian kind of films, Life is Beautiful, Postino, etc., where, again, they're deeply touching, warm human stories. So that's the way to get to the um, Oscars. If you notice that even in the regular Oscars, the big commercial films very rarely make it. They get lots of money at the box office. They might win some technical awards for special effects and, and awards for uh, costume, but they never get the best picture awards. So the way to the Oscars is to make genuinely, deeply felt human stories. Uh, if I may add to that, sure, I sure. think we also focus too much on what will work at the Oscars. Mm. I think we just need to, like you said, make a good film that um, tells a story that's universal, that will connect with people, you know, because sometimes, um, like he spoke about films, most um, foreign language films end up being European films because they understand that more. They, they're able to identify, relate with European films more. But I think a universal film is a universal film. Hum uh, human emotions are really universal. So I think th there's too much. I've been privy to a lot of conversations where I've heard people say, but you know, this is surely an Oscar entry. And then it goes there and then it's, it figures absolutely nowhere. Right. So maybe um, just take this, think out of the box. Think that maybe give them a chance to think out of the box. Make the film that you believe in, send it there, and then let's see what happens. So at the end of the day, Vidya, you're saying all it needs is a good kahani. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The next you, question... Let me say that the buzz around this year's entry for India's entry for the Oscars court is, is very good. Yeah. People are genuinely touched, moved, and shaken by that film. Um, so maybe we've got a real shot this year. Yeah more part to what you're saying just now. And uh, the next question is for you, Vidya, and this comes from Dr. Major Satish. He wants to know, <clears throat> and watch me turn into a fake Vidya Balan right now, is there more entertainment, entertainment, entertainment in films or in parenthood? I have no idea why he's asking you that. <laughs> I have nothing to do with this question, seriously. Dr. Satish, are you a gynecologist or an <laughs> obstetrician? <laughs> I really want to know. <laughs> and an alumnus from uh, IMB at that. I don't know um, how that combo works. Um, no, I, I can assure you that there will be lots more entertainment in films. I'm not sure I see parenting as something entertainment, as something that could be entertaining at this point of time. So. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, let's keep entertainment for the big screen. Then. <laughs> uh, Kabir, this question's for you. You must have seen a lot of failure all around you. What have you learned from the failure 
that you have seen around you in the treacherous creative industry? You know, um, apart from seeing failure, I've also experienced failure in various ways. The, the thing that is quite amazing to me is how easy people think acting is and how easy the film business is. Because you see the successful people. Firstly, the successful people's job is to make it look easy on screen. Secondly, of maybe a thousand people a day that come to Churchgate Station to become actors, you know, maybe one in 10,000 uh, gets the right breaks, gets the right breakthroughs, makes success. Um, whenever people say, what advice do you have for young actors? I say, don't, don't. It's a very tricky business, <laughs> dangerous business. But if you have the madness enough, have the passion enough to disregard what I'm saying, then do it because you do it for what you love, because that will sustain you even through times of failure, and that will give you satisfaction, no matter what kind of success it gives you, and hopefully when it gives you success, you will still enjoy the process and not think of it as a job. I think it's very important for people to learn from not only their failures, but the failures of others, because otherwise, you will never, never know the sweetness of success. That coming from, that coming from the guns and glory man. Um, the next question is for Vidya, and this question goes, yeah, it's by Nishant Nayak, and he asks, is the Padma Shri an award or a reward? How has your engagement changed with the government since the award? Uh, I think uh, the Padma Shri is an honor that um, I'm pretty good with words, I think. <laughs> so you asked me if it's an award or reward, and I'm saying it's an honor. But I think it's an honor bestowed upon you uh, on behalf of the country. And I, I don't think my equation with the government has uh, you know, gone beyond me being a citizen of this country. I, I think that remains just the way. I'm not really politically inclined and I don't have, uh, I'm, I'm brand ambassador for a, a national brand ambassador for sanitation, but besides that, not really. Nothing's changed. It's an award and a reward. It's both and an honor. It's all those things. Yeah. But that is such an awesome engagement, especially you being the ambassador and coming from you. Your word is really taken so seriously. It's a delight watching you there. I think one Thank last you. question for, for the two of you. And um, uh, this person wants to know, people say education kills creativity. How do you think children in this country should be educated to keep creativity alive? Good question. Very good question. I think... Um, you know, the new system of education really uh, promises to um, encourage creativity. Um, th there are no set uh, modules that are being followed. It's uh, what we call the IB system of education. There are some others also, which allow for a lot of flexibility for a child to choose what a child wants to do. I think especially in the initial years, structure um, can be done away with. You know, because st structure tends to, um, tends to, uh, what is the word, please help me? Restrict, <laughs> restrict, restrict, thank you. S structure tends to restrict you anyway when you go out into the world a little later in life, you are having to adhere to structure. So I think in the initial years, if you're just allowed to uh, you know, there, there's another, I think Tridha is uh, the school, there's a school in Bombay where it's all about your five senses. It's about touching, feeling, um, smelling. It's opening up your senses to the world and that's how you learn things. I think that's also a very innovative way. Um, so I, school systems can kill creativity, but I think there's hope at this point. There is. There is. You want to add to that, Kabir Sahib? No. Obviously, in the, in the formal learning uh, system, there are, there are restrictions. But you know, I have great faith in, in human nature. Firstly, I think each one of us in this room remembers the one teacher that 
looked at us, recognized that certain spark in you, encouraged it, brought out your creativity in some ways. It doesn't have to be an art teacher, it can be in any, 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 any subject. Those kinds of people inspire and lead. And it is also not just a question of education. I think it is a job of parents to encourage creativity. Parents have to instill creativity, encourage it, reward it. But ultimately, creativity is your own responsibility. If it's within you, it will come out, it will express itself, no matter how restrictive the school system, no matter how conservative or rigid your parents. If it's in you, it'll come out. If the song is there, you'll sing it. 